Pastor Benny Hinn often talks about how Catherine Coleman's life and ministry impacted his own development as a young preacher of the gospel and how attending her services led him into a deep and intimate knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Benny has made a special arrangement with the Catherine Coleman Foundation in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for permission to air selected episodes of I Believe in Miracles, Miss Coleman's television program from the 1960s and 70s. But now let's join Miss Coleman during a program originally recorded in 1969 as she teaches on the budding of the fig tree. The Lord showed to Jeremiah two baskets of figs. And that's the first time that we have the sign of the figs in the Old Testament. Now, the Lord God had a reason for doing it. This is what he showed to Jeremiah. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. The other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. There was no mistaking. Figs. Sure. The good figs, the very good, and the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten, they're so evil. And here, I want you to understand something. Watch it. Here is again the picture of Israel. Only watch the psychology that God used in this. He first gave us the picture of the good things that's so like you. Uh-huh. The positive, the good things. And then after after the good figs, the bad figs, the evil figs. And in the picture of the evil figs, we see Israel in her time of apostasy. During that time when God could not look upon her sin of unbelief. Watch it. This is really. And again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place in the land of the Chaldeans for their good. I will set mine eyes upon them for good. I will bring them again to the land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole hearts. Watch. I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt. He's turning now to the evil figs, the naughty figs the disobedient children of Israel. I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be reproach and a proverb, a taunt, a curse in all places, whether I have dry them. I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. Now, I've given you the Old Testament, the picture of disobedient Israel. The Jews scattered to the four corners of the earth, we see them desolate. They're suffering. They're years of persecution. But again, the Lord said, I will, I will, I will restore them. And they will, they will accept me with their whole heart. All right, hold that just a minute. 
Go back, if you will, please, to that wonderful portion of the Word of God that I've given you over and over again. When on the Mount of Olives, the disciples asked for a sign of the time when we have the end of the Gentiles returning again to Israel in their land, their promised land. And again, he gave the fig tree. Oh, sure, it's there. He gave that parable. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, you know it. Hold it just a minute. Now, Go, if you will, please, to that familiar portion in the 11th chapter of Mark when Jesus cursed the fig tree. You know it. I'll read it to you. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. Sure, I'm talking to folk who have walked that distance, even as I have. It isn't a long walk. Just visualize Jesus with his disciples walking it. One evening, they had been in the temple in Jerusalem, it was now getting dark, and slowly they walked into Bethany. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, which was not unusual. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. But that, my friend, is not the end of the story. Oh, sure, every minister who has ever stood in this pulpit has a sermon on the cursing the fig tree. Sure. When Jesus, being hungry, came to the fig tree, he found that it had no fruit on it whatsoever, only leaves. He cursed it. Religion is one thing. With just religion, there'll be no spiritual fruit, none whatsoever. But go a little further. This is not the end of it. You do not find the secret of the cursing the fig tree unless you read the 20th verse of the same chapter. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up but don't stop there. For years we have just stopped there. The fact that Jesus had cursed the fig tree. And the next day when they passed by, they saw that that fig tree that had been cursed was now dried up. And we've left it there. Don't do it. That's the way so many folks read the Word of God. Continue for the next three words are the secrets to this glorious, wonderful thing that Jesus did. I read it in its entirety. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. It was only cursed from the roots up. The life of that fig tree was in the roots. When Jesus cursed it, all that was cursed was that which could be seen 
visibly. That's all. There was no curse up on the roots whatsoever. Life remained in the roots. Watch it now. When the disciples asked Jesus, as they sat together on the Mount of Olives, what shall be a sign? How will folk know, living in that generation, how will they know the time when the Holy Spirit is about to leave? When will they know when they're coming to the end of the time of the Gentiles? When will they know the time of the return of the Lord back to earth again? Surely they will have a sign. You've always given them a sign. Always. What master will be the sign? And this is why he answered. Watch it. You have no understanding of what he was talking about unless you fully understand the cursing of the fig tree. He goes back. Learn a parable of the fig tree, the same fig tree. When his branch is yet tender. Think how many generations have come and gone. Think of the centuries that have passed into history. And the fig tree seemingly remained cursed. The Jews are people without a country. Literally, not thousands, but millions of them killed, hated. A nation without a country, a people without a haven. The suffering only God knows the suffering that they have gone through generation after generation because of their unbelief, because of their apostasy. Why this terrific judgment? Why this terrific chastisement? Because, my friend, of the blessing of God prior to this judgment. God had blessed them with blessings that he had never and has never given to a people. I see him in his tender mercy, his long suffering, blessing them over and over and over again. Oh, the light that Jehovah God had given to them the protection that Jehovah God had given to them. Now I want to stop right here and say to you, be careful. You who've had the light, you who have been called, you who know the word of truth, you who have had the knowledge of the word, you who know what it's all about, You've tasted it. I'm not telling you anything that you do not know. When I say to you, you've tasted of the things of God. You've tasted of the blessings of God. You know, I don't have to tell you. There is a place in him where his presence is so wonderful. But remember something. To stay in that place is a life without a compromise. And the minute you compromise, and the minute you become disobedient unto him, that blessing lips and you're asking for trouble. There'll be sorrow, there'll be heartache, as sure as you live and breathe, because you've known 
because you paced it. And God had to chastise the children of Israel for their disobedience. And he turned from the Jew to the Gentile. He's coming back now again to keep all of those covenants. And slowly but surely, that fig tree that was cursed from the roots up. But all through those years of chastisement, there was still life in those roots. That life never died. Never. Never. Jesus said, you want a sign? All right, I'll give it to you. And this is what he said. Learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, that branch of Israel is very tender. Very tender. So young a nation. So tender. But those leaves are coming forth. And put forth leaves. The leaves, my friend, are on the fig tree. They're there. And God is beginning to keep his earthly covenants to an earthly people. Things are happening very quickly, very quickly, very rapidly. Things that perhaps you do not understand. There's only one today who fully understands what's taking place. That's the Christian. That's God's children because he knows the word. I want to say just now, I pray to God that he'll give you judgment day honesty. The only place in the whole world today where you'll find real peace is in the heart of a man or a woman, whether he be Jew or Gentile, regardless of nationality. The only place where you'll find real peace from here on out will be in the heart of a man or a woman who's been born again. For I cannot give you a beautiful picture of the future, knowing God's word as I do. We can kid ourselves and say that things are getting better. We can kid ourselves, hopefully saying things will be better. But knowing the Word of God, it's getting darker and darker. We're nearing the midnight hour. How do I know? When you see these things begin to come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the very door. In this moment, and it only takes a moment for this wonderful transaction, I beg of you before it's too late, before it's too late, Do the thing that's most important to you now. Accept him as your savior. And now, wonderful Jesus, this very moment, that transaction in that life, in that heart, when all things pass away and behold, all things become new. As your own Holy Spirit puts his seal upon that transaction, God's Word lives and abides forever. Today you heard a 
powerful message by Catherine Kuhlman. As you know, her foundation has allowed us to air some of her programs and I want to pray with you right now. I'm asking God today to anoint your life and to prepare you for the coming of His precious Son, Jesus. And then I'm going to pray that the Lord will heal you today and set you free. Now, precious Lord, I thank you for your word and your promises. And I do pray today, anoint everyone watching this program. Prepare each one for your blessed coming. Your word declares unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before the throne with joy. Granted, I pray that we all be strengthened today and on that day be blameless for your glory. And now, precious Lord, heal that one calling on your name. Bring health and strength. Remove that sickness. Drive away that disease. In your precious and glorious name, amen and amen. Serve an awesome Lord. You've just seen a classic of Catherine Kuhlman from her daily programs that we aired years ago. I wanted to show it to you again today because I believe we need the word of God that she preached so powerfully. And again, thank you for being my wonderful partner and friend. And I want to pray with you right now that God would bless you for your support, for supporting the ministry. And I'm going to ask you also to give that we can continue finishing the digitizing of all those wonderful old messages, not only of our own meetings and crusades, but also of others like Miss Kuhlman. And the Lord will bless you for that because our children need to see these our grandchildren need to see these i just came back from colorado springs i'm on my way to canada in fact uh tomorrow and i'm just so amazed to see the hunger today in the young people i had the youth come down in one of the meetings and half the audience were young people thousands of people there and half of them young people and I hear the same thing will be so in Canada. I'll be ministering to a lot of youth in Canada. So this is the upcoming future generation that needs to see these programs that have touched millions. Let's do it together for the Lord, please. And wonderful Jesus, I thank you for Lord, for blessing your people even now, Lord, financially. I pray you'll prosper them, increase them on every side. Bless the work of their hands, wonderful Jesus. And Lord, thank you for the privilege that you've given us to serve you and give to your work. And to you be all the glory. And God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you again for watching. We'll show you these special classics every so often. But again tomorrow, a very powerful program on the Lord Jesus revealed in the Gospel of John, you don't want to miss tomorrow. But go ahead and give right now to the Lord's work. You can give on the platform you're watching me on, or go to our website, benahim.org, or simply text BHM45777. And thank you again for your love and your support. I'll see you tomorrow. Benningham Ministries has stayed on the cutting edge for the past five decades, making the move from analog television to digital broadcasts, HDTV, the internet, streaming live events, and social media. Today's fast-changing, bold new world brings an entirely new set of challenges. What we did in 1974 when this ministry began, or in 2000, or even 2022, will not be effective in 2023. And who knows what 2024 and beyond will bring. Benny Hinn's ministry has been at the forefront of each innovation that provides a better way of taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world more effectively and efficiently. Today, more than ever before, we stand on the edge of a bold new world. From the beginning, the Lord made it clear that keeping and storing all archives and resources should be a top priority. This is a new hour. This is the Joshua generation. Now I want to tell you something. 
The first thing God said to Moses is go down. The first thing he said to Joshua is arise. We're not a people who are going down. We're ones who are rising up. Even with controlled temperature storage facilities, time has been the enemy. Tape warping, decay, housing detachments, cracks, shredding, and breakdowns happen. Older tapes break, disintegrate, and require surgical type methods of restoration. Thus far, we've rescued and digitized 10,500 of the 13,437 tapes from the past half century. To God be the glory, a conservative estimate to finish this digitation process is a million dollars to restore the final 30% of these disintegrating tapes and move everything over to a much more permanent digital format. The project, already started, can be completed fairly quickly. Imagine, if you will, what could happen if all of our digitized material could be used to translate everything into every language on Earth. It is possible. Even better, how exciting would it be to translate these materials using the same voice as originally spoken, yet in all of the different dialects around the world? Pastor Benny speaks several languages, but imagine if his teachings became available online with him speaking in Swahili, Mandarin, Portuguese, Belarusian, or Cherokee. This amazing AI tool will be useful around the world. Pastor Benny's legacy, life's work, calling, and anointing will be preserved for generations yet to come until the Lord returns. And with artificial intelligence tools that can translate all of the digitized materials into languages around the world, we can truly fulfill our Lord's great commission. Nearly 50 years ago, this great adventure known as Benny Hen Ministries began with one voice. Today, that one voice continues to be amplified over and over through every possible means. It's time to finish the job. What happens next will be the greatest blessing of all. I believe in miracles. with all of my heart. And I have to believe in miracles. I see them happening around me every day of my life. But I believe in miracles because I believe in God. I want to dedicate the telecast today to the memory of a woman whose life influenced the lives of thousands and thousands of people through the years. I never met this wonderful lady. I deeply regret that I never met her. And yet, I feel as though I've known her all of my life. And perhaps nobody in the whole world living today appreciates her ministry, appreciates this woman more than the one who's speaking to you now. She too, a woman preaching the gospel. She too, a woman who believed in miracles. 
She too was a woman who had dedicated her life to Jesus. She too was a woman who loved lost souls. Perhaps no one living could fully understand the loneliness that she went through in her life better than I. For a life that's dedicated to the Lord is sometimes a very lonely life. It can be so lonely. There are the thousands of people around you. You've stood before them for hours, giving every ounce of strength that you have in your body. Sometimes you feel as though your legs won't hold you up any longer. And you give, and you give, and you give every ounce of strength that there is in your body. And then you go home. You wish you had given a little more, had there been a little more to give. Your heart aches for those that you couldn't reach or those who were not healed. When you love souls, it's the heaviest burden in the world to carry. Though I've never seen this woman, I share the loneliness and the consecration and her fellowship with him. And now, the voice of the lovely lady of whom I have been speaking, millions have heard her voice. Here it is. We have no need to doubt God. God lives. God's word is true. God's word has been proven. Angela Temple with this great multitude here tonight, filled uh, with hearts that know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Say amen. amen. Know Jesus Christ as their healer. Amen. Know Christ as a baptizer with the Holy Ghost. And believe in the coming of the Lord. Oh, thank God for the power of faith. And that was the voice of Amy Semple McPherson. My guest today, the daughter and the son of this great lady with a great faith in a great God. Oh, 
Today are the daughter and the son of Amy Semple McPherson, Roberta. <laughs> oh, anyone who knew Amy Semple McPherson knew about her lovely young daughter, Roberta, who is affectionately known as Bertie, who is now Mrs. Harry Salter. And Ms. McPherson's son, Rolf, who is today Dr. Rolf McPherson. Oh, I tell you, I don't think anyone in the whole world was any more proud of her children than your mother was proud of the two of you. I suppose you realized that when you were children. Did you really? Oh, I think so. We really enjoyed being <laughs> the children that we were. I guess that's true. And you know... I did something that, um, oh, I just love it. No one ever looked at these pictures and enjoyed them any more than I've enjoyed them. Here is one. Let's take the first one. Here's your mother and uh, Roberta. There you are, the great big hair ribbon in your hair. When I look at that, I smiled because I can produce some pictures too with a hair ribbon equally as large. Do, do you remember when this was taken? Oh, yes, indeed. And I remember those sailor suits. We had two suits apiece, Rolf and I. Two dark ones for the winter and two white ones for the summer. And that was our uniform, so no one ever knew we had no other clothes. And it worked out very well. You mean you, you just didn't have? We didn't have. All we lived out of the missionary barrel. But these, these were our formal school going out clothes. Rolf, you remember? Our home for the first six years was our car and a little tent that we pitched by the road, so you couldn't carry very many clothes along. But those were wonderful years, weren't they? Oh, they were exciting years. Sure. And, and Roberta, you, you uh, were born after the death of your father. My father died one month before I was born in Hong Kong, China. And mother was a widow, under 20, with a brand new baby, and stranded 12,000 miles from home. Just consider that. Consider your mother not only had faith, your mother was not only a great woman of faith, your mother was a great woman of courage. But wait a moment. Before we go out in there, I just remembered. When I was born, she was alone there. She hadn't even the fare to, to go home to her mother, and she didn't have money for the funeral for my father. They were penniless babies in the woods. But when she opened, the letter came the next day, she opened that letter, and it said, Dear Sister McPherson, the Dear Sister Semple, that was yes. the name then, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and said, Send Sister Semple some money. She said, Well, all I have is $60. She said, Send it. She said, I'll do it tomorrow. She said, No, get out of bed, 
put the money in an envelope and send it. Money gets stolen. The Lord's voice said, very clearly she says, I will take care of that money. The money arrived in China the day after my father died. And mother had money for funeral services and a little money to begin to live. A telegram then came from my grandmother, of course, with cable money to come home. But miracles do happen in strange ways. And you were that little tiny baby. Think of it, Roberta. You were that little tiny baby born to a young widow, only 20 years of age, in Hong Kong, China, alone. At that point, you're right. She could have quit. But she had the courage to she go on. She could have quit. She could have quit. Do you realize simple. that your mother could have quit over and over and over again? I think the two of you know the courage of your mother better than anyone else in the whole world. Right, Rolf? We sure do. We traveled day by day with her, and we felt like the children of Israel. <laughs> uh, we didn't know what was going to happen the next day, but the Lord always provided. And your mother uh, had... Uh, do you remember those days of the tent? I surely do. Uh, we enjoyed traveling in those tents, but our home was the little tent, and the storms that broke overhead, the lightning would flash right through the canvas, and the rain would come through, too, and Mother would sit by the cot and tell us Bible stories, holding an umbrella over us to keep us dry. Well, <laughs> really? Oh, absolutely. And, and, she, and she was always... Uh, Everything was bright and cheerful so far as she was concerned. Well, things were a game. I mean, she made us feel this was the world. If we had a little simple tent, she showed us the dew on the, on the uh, grass. Or showed it, or we hung our Christmas presents. I had a ball and jack this Christmas. And I think you got a jackknife. But they, they were tied onto a cactus bush on, on, the, <laughs> on the beach at uh, Palm Spring. No, Palm, Palm Beach. You could have bought any acreage there you wanted then for $3 an acre, but we didn't have $3. And that's all that you got for Christmas? That's right. All right, and your mother always dressed in, in white uniforms. How in the world did she get those uniforms uh, 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 laundried? Well, first of all, the reason she wore the white uniform was she couldn't afford an expensive dress, and that was really a white maid's uniform. With, with oh, a cape put on, sure. like the Red Cross nurses had. But when she rolled into town, she had to have a clean uniform for the next church service. Mm -hmm. She stopped by the roadside and washed it in a stream, hung it out to dry, and Rolf and I went out looking for berries or for something to, to nibble on over the sidelines or played in the rolling down the hills. And then when it was dry, she ironed it, using for the ironing board the back seat of the car. And when she arrived in town, she was beautiful and dazzling. You would have thought she had 10,000 maids at home. <laughs> But she did it herself, and she always said, don't be a preacher unless you really want to work. Ah. Unless you love the Lord enough to, to scrub the floor and dust the pews. And... and no one ever knew. No one ever saw behind the scenes, did no, they? No. No one ever knew when you were hungry. That's right. The Lord knew, and he provided. Sometimes Mother had given away the very last money that she had and was praying, Lord, if you want us to eat, you'll have to supply it. If you want us to fast, we'll do that. <laughs> And then just about that time would come a knock on the door and somebody with a basket of food over their arm said, the Lord spoke to me while I was cooking dinner today and said, prepare some for the evangelist and her children. And they came looking for us. Tell about that. What was it? Shoes once? Shoes? You, you had to have shoes and, and you always got what was out of the missionary bail, right? Right. Some folks had sent a barrel of clothes to the south where my mother was ministering and They'd forgotten. It was six months <laughs> since I was there, and I'd grown. Sure, children the, grow. The shoes didn't fit. They were too small. And my sister had the answer. What'd well, you do? Mother, mother was telling us the story that night <laughs> before she went to preach. Our bedtime story about the children of Israel crossing 40 years of the desert. And, of course, like a kid, I said, uh, well, in 40 years, didn't their feet grow? Hmm. And she said, yeah, of course. She was in a hurry to get on her way, and they were playing the first hymn in the big tent. And I said, but really, Mother, how did, how did uh, they keep the shoes on their feet? And she was a little bit impatient for once in her life, and she said, oh, I suppose God stretched them. <laughs> and, but I wouldn't stop there. I said, let's pray to God to stretch Rolf's shoes. And kind of shamefacedly, I must admit, she got down and joined us in our prayer. Now, I don't know what happened. 
whether Wolf's speech funk or whether the Lord sets the shoes, but in the morning they fit just fine. And you wore right, the shoes. Right. God supplied wonderfully for us. Our lives were filled with miracles. You were brought up on miracles, and it was a way of living with her. Do you remember seeing your mother cry? Yes, there were times that things, like any woman, there were tears, but they never stopped her. She'd get up and wash her face, put a little dust of powder on her nose, and go into the pulpit. And stand and in front of the whole crowd? Absolutely. No one ever knew. Ever knew the burden she was carrying? Right. Or the heartbreak? Once, as she was just about to go into one of these meetings, she was preparing for the tent meeting, and she had a carbide lamp, and it exploded right in her face and burned her face very badly. And here the crowd was gathering, and she just didn't know what to do. But finally, she went into that service and began to preach, and the Lord healed her as she preached. And she just began to praise the Lord, and everybody joined in rejoicing with her. And before that service was over, she was absolutely made whole again. Thank God for her courage. Ralph, do you know that now the International Church of the Four Square Gospel is celebrating its 50th anniversary, right? Yes, What is. if your mother had given up? Roberta, what when she was left a widow over there in Hong Kong, had she given up? God would have sent somebody else to do the job. He would have gotten the job done all right. But there were so many times that all of us could quit. That's well, right. One more step. That's right. To take us on our way. Ralph, how many churches now, after all of these years, and your mother's, and there were those who said, oh, when Amy Semple McPherson goes, the whole thing will collapse. She's been gone, but how many churches continue? What, Ralph? From that first church, there are now thousands of churches scattered around the world. 27 countries were preaching the gospel. And the work is growing day by day. It's stronger than it's ever been. Right. And this convention is going to bring people from all of these nations to this great convention. Uh, one young man that's coming, we're very happy that he's going to be with us, but he was the son of a family of cannibals in New Guinea. And he went eight years of age. We reached him with the gospel, and his life was changed. He's a grown man now, and one of our leading ministers He's coming to speak at our convention. I said a few minutes ago, I never had the privilege of having met this wonderful woman, not only of faith, but of great courage. But one day, long before I ever had a ministry in Los Angeles, Maggie was with me. We were driving through a forest lawn. And as we were slowly driving down the roads, I suddenly saw this beautiful monument erected to the memory of Amy Simple. I was driving. I said, Maggie, I want to stop the car. And we walked slowly up to the beautiful monument. Someone else had arrived before we arrived. A lady was standing there. I couldn't really tell you how old. Just standing there. And the tears were streaming down her face. And by her side was a young man about 17 years of age. I assumed it was her son. I can tell you exactly what the two looked like. She was talking to the young man. He was just standing there with his head bowed, listening to every word. I came close enough that I could hear what she was saying. She said, you know, if only you had known her, 
he was the one who led me to Jesus Christ. And then she wiped the falling tears, and he would continue to listen. Oh, she said when she preached, she made Jesus. I found Christ through the ministry of this woman. I turned away. I found myself just wiping the tears away from my own cheeks. And I walked in silence to the car. And I looked up and said, Oh God, if after I would have lived my last day here on earth, if after I've done my last day's work, if I should go before the great rapture, before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, if just one person could stand by my grave and say, I found Christ as my Savior because this woman lived then I, too, will have lived a successful life. If just one person would have found Christ through my life, then believe me, the heartbreak and the sorrows and the disappointments and the misunderstandings of the world mean nothing whatsoever. It will have been a price worth paying. Wonderful partner and family, you have just seen one of the newly digitized life-changing messages. Many messages like this are being digitized today from the 80s and the 90s including crusades and this is your day programs and so much more. And we want to show you more and more of them to bless your life, to strengthen you in the Lord, that your walk will be strong in these days where we need to hear the word of God. These messages and crusades were so anointed by the Lord and that anointing is still on them. And we want to bring them to you. But I need your help. I need your help because to digitize these amazing sermons, teaching, crusades, and so much more costs a lot of money. You've given already some of that money. Thank you from all my heart, I say. But we have digitized already hundreds of them, but there's hundreds more still need to be digitized. Would you consider today to help us bring you many more messages that will really bless not only this generation, but many generations to come. Our children, grandchildren will be, will be blessed by them. Because the Lord, I believe, will use that blessed word that was preached and taught back in the 80s and the 90s. Let's do it for his glory today. So you can give right now on the platform you're watching me on, or you can simply go to our website, benin.org, or simply text. Whatever amount you give will help us keep doing what we began to do months ago, and we want to do more and more and more for the glory of our precious Jesus. And that is in, in addition to all that I do live, because my aim and my one desire is to strengthen you, the body of Christ. So thank you again for being with us today and listening and share these amazing messages with your friends and those who follow you on social media. Much love, and I'll see you again.